what a surfboard has to do with Industry 4.0, and uh, the short video clip explained. Um, this is really a surfboard which is, which is customized. Actually, it's made for me. Um, <laughs> but using mass manufacturing technologies. So a company found out that they are, limit, they are limited by their technology in order to really grow the company. And though they came to the idea to have an online platform where you can key in your data, which wave you want to ride, how big you are, how tall you are. Um, and then they, they make computer designs your perfect surfboard. And it's then manufactured with Industry 4.0 tools. So it's, they speed up, and really that boosts uh, the, the uh, revenue of this company. So again, when always I say Industry 4.0 affects all, all the markets Siemens is serving. And this holds true for many, many others. And this is one example. Well, very often I'm asked, why is it happened now? Industry 4.0 is in everybody's mind. It's changing, changing our environment. What's the reason for that? And actually, there are three reasons. Number one is we have new technologies. Number two is we have digital technologies. New technologies, I mean, let's talk about renewables, costs go down, storage, costs go down, lithium ion, lithium ion batteries are increasing in volume tremendously. Um, we have um, power electronics developing further. 5G, 5G is the next big thing. Without 5G, we'll, no, we'll have no autonomous driving. You have edge devices, so sensors, which are connected. The sensors do have processing power storage, which costs less and less. And again, they are connected with high speed, big data, or low latency. Um, we have data centers mushrooming. That means sheer endless storage, sheer endless processing power. Our AI guys, our artificial intelligence guys, they say, I can really have processing power using all the algorithms, which some of them are invented maybe 20 years ago, they come now into place. So a lot of things going on on technologies, and I can go on and on, but there's a third element, and maybe this is the most important one. The third element is that we see business models are changing. We used to sell turbines or power plants. Now customers want to buy reliable power. Automotive manufacturers, they are selling cars. They will, you, in the future, they will uh, share cars, it will be a shared economy, so they may, they may have a completely different business model. So this mix makes an explosive mix, and this is the reason why we have a couple of elements which are changing all our markets, yours as well. In one way, explosive uh, development means exponential development. I mean, think about some companies like Uber, within their short period of existence, their market capitalization is as big as some OEM companies, automotive companies, which are there for 100 years. Um, Airbnb has more bookings than the largest uh, hotel companies in the world, by the way. None of them are owning assets. There's another element which comes in. This is about changing the value chain. Think about your value chain. The weakest link of this value chain will be attacked by Industry 4.0, by digitalization. Distributors, for example. Um, why not connect indirectly? Amazon is one of these examples. And there's another element. The typical value chain of tier one, tier two, tier three is going to change. And what we will see is ecosystems. We will see that this is a kind of a co-development of solutions in a much, much bigger environment. So that means you have to co-petition co in, the, in the same time you compete, you cooperate, and customer sits in the middle. Uh, actually solving problems um, which are much broader than what we did before. So product selling is not doing the trick anymore. It's changing. So this is about Industry 4.0. And uh, so since I'm a uh, technology officer, I can uh, spare three minutes on what is really our digitalization strategy and how that looks like. I guide you in a couple of clicks through the whole thing. Well, it starts, it starts where the data are generated. It starts at the lower level where you have sensors, actuators. It starts basically with your service business, if you have some, because you have a huge installed base, installed fleet, and they're generating data. And this is the first thing when we talk to customers. They say, OK, help me. I need to connect data. OK, sounds simple. It's as complex as it can be. You see on the bottom the different um, 
businesses or markets which we are serving. On the right side, you see an MR scanner, a symbol for health healthcare, MR scanner. This MR scanner dumps you a terabyte of data in 15 minutes. On the other side, you see smart metering, the grid. We have 50 million meters, each of them sending uh, every five minutes a couple of bytes. So this is the bandwidth you, which you're gonna have. Buildings speak other languages regarding the protocol than industry machines, than signaling systems, than trains or turbines. So you have to cover a very, very broad range of different kind of protocols. But it's not the end. Some want to read, just read the data and monitor. Others want to read and write. They want to manage. Here comes the first point where customers are saying, oh, I need to do that extremely cyber secure because I don't want to have somebody um, um, hacking from the edge, from the, from the lowest devices into my system and, and corrupt it. So this is a very important element. So reading and writing is important. Cybersecurity. And then, last but not least, I mean, I can go on and on as well, there are devices sitting out there for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but you want to have them updated all the time. If there's a new patch for cybersecurity, you want to have to update and patch them out of the cloud. So all of that, all of that has to be done regarding connecting your devices. Once you connect your devices and you gather the data, of course, you have to store them. Here comes the next layer. We call it operating system. It's an operating system which supports you in connecting you to any kind of cloud service. Could be a private cloud on-premise, could be a public cloud, commercial available cloud, all the cloud services you want to access. You want to store the data in a safe environment. What you have, you have a um, kind of level of asset management included, artificial intelligence, algorithms should be in there. Um, there's access controls, a lot of things which come with, with this operating system, which makes you basically providing the base platform for then developing really value, value for, for our customers. With that, if you, have a, if you have an iPhone with no app, just the operating system, it's not really fun. So the next level is really then the software or the services, digital services, which come on top, which really provide you then the value. And um, this was a little bit abstract, I admit, but I give you a couple of examples how that looks like now. Let me talk on the upper left, software. If you think additive manufacturing, 3D printing is something about hardware, I tell you, it's more software than it's about hardware. It's materials and it's software. And there's one example, what we do is with our software suite, we printed blades for gas turbines. First row, these are the blades which have to stand heat of 1,500 degree and above. We printed them and right away from the printing machine, put it into a turbine, running them in the turbine. Another element where you use the software suite in digitalization, what we say you create a digital twin of the world which you want to set, set into real life later. And there's a very good example which um, I like very much. Together with Adidas, we are piloting now that what they call Speed Factory. So what is it about? It's basically about, I mean, you know, Shoe manufacturing doesn't happen in Germany anymore. I mean, that happens in places with low, lowest cost uh, regarding labor. They are trying now to make a personalized shoe, lot-sized one, for the cost of mass manufacturing in fully automating that's, that's, that's slide, that site. It is digitalized. It's a digital twin. We basically simulate the whole world, the shoe, the material, the manufacturing, um, the logistics. And once that's done, we go into real life. Next one, this stands for our train. We, we, are, we can run trains in analyzing the data from the trains. We can run trains with an availability of 99.9x uh, uh, reliability. How that? We have analysts, they're looking to the data. Biggest headache, by the, headache, by the way, for most of the operators are doors. Doors is really a big headache. Um, and what our guys did, they used that all the data coming from trains historic data, compared it, and now they're able to predict within 10 days on which car, which door is going to fail and why, which gives an operator the opportunity to order the spare parts, to pull the train out of operation, repair it, bring it back. We are heading for 100% availability. And if you operate trains, some, very often they buy 110, 120% capacity to run 100. Um, what, think about what it means if you just can buy that what you need because you can run it. We do the same for gearboxes, for, for wheels, but also for the infrastructure. I'll come to that a little bit later. 
These are motors. Motors out there, um, Siemens is selling motors like hell. We have all of them sitting somewhere outside. These are dump motors. We developed a box which we connect to the motor. The box measures temperature, vibration, and magnetic flux. And in doing so, you made out of a dump motor that what IT guys call an edge device, meaning it's connected, it speaks, the motor speaks then via our platform to the applications, and then, then now you can find out what's happening to the motor, um, when does it need to repair, when to go out and, and, and uh, replace it or look for a spare part. So Industry 4.0 is one of the big things uh, which the Germans started off well ahead, maybe of many other countries. On the, on the left side you see these are the elements. It is as complex as it can be because you need, and by the way, not, not, not a country, not a company can pull the whole thing and bring it to life. You need to set standards. You have to agree on standards because you to want leverage really a big supply base. Um, you need to train your people. Uh, education and training is one of the biggest elements. Um, you need to have a, a kind of a cybersecurity environment and define what you, what you have to expect from whatever kind of systems you're running. You need to have test labs. At the end of the day, don't forget, when we install Industry 4.0 or when you install an application, it's not that you can just try it. If it doesn't work, you take it out. This is end to end. It really attaches the core of your processes. So if that doesn't work, your manufacturing stands still. You don't want to fool around with it, so that means you need test labs to try your technology and then roll it out. We, um, Germany was also collaborating with other European countries. Um, recently we met in Rome, talked about how we can leverage that. And again, this Australia is making a, a very strong co collaboration, um, rolling over what, what we learned in Germany, what we do there, and bring it into your country. What we do in order to support it, um, and you just mentioned it, uh, Matthias, we, we, have this, uh, we, we issued the, the second software grant uh, yesterday, the, day, the day before yesterday. There was one um, which already for the Swinburne University. Why is it so important? This is a transformation regarding technologies, but it's much more a transformation regarding the development of people. Development of people, the, the skills of blue color, white color in a manufacturing side, an in industry 4.0 manufacturing side, that doesn't compare to that what you used to have in the past. So education and training goes from apprenticeship training to the highest level of training. We need to support that. We recently acquired a company here uh, talking about, I was talking about um, monitoring also the rail infrastructure, MRX Technologies. They have a brilliant technology. They're using magnetic flux to detect broken rails. I tell you, this is a very important element for the mining industry in order to really have their, their trains up and running. And uh, we want to use that for the next kind of level to develop it further. I talked about the software grant. Last one. You wonder, how do you develop these kind of applications? How is that going? And we have a model we call Data Analytics and Application Center. It's easily explained. What we do is, we took, uh, we, we created some space in a manufacturing site for rolling stock, where you do metal bending, welding, and whatnot. In this space, we brought the brightest data analysts sitting in the middle of that manufacturing site next to the engineers who know how to build a train. They know where the centers are, they know how this whole thing runs. They're sitting next to each other and they do nothing but thinking about what are the pain points. I've talked about the doors, I can talk about the rails or whatever. What are the pain points? We want to bring these application centers also next to customers because this is so important to have a clear focus on the use cases, on the pain points of a certain market. So we bring this together, and with this expertise of domain know-how, together with analytics capabilities, gathering all the data and doing nothing all day long and thinking about how can I use this, source these pain points. This is what we call DACs. It's very successful. Meanwhile, we have almost 20 of them um, regarding, for, for all industries. Is it food and beverage? Is it machine tooling? Is it trains? Is it gas turbines? Is it healthcare systems, and there's one more to come, which we are about to, op to open around this MRX technology, which will be in Perth. It will be one DAC for mining. Where would you put a DAC if for mining, if not in Perth? With that, I think you'll like it. Thank you. So.
we are very much excited about it, and um, we'll be back and look at that. And I tell you, um, if you if you go to this place, you, it's mind blowing what these guys are doing. In particular, having these two different disciplines of analytic science and engineering sitting next to each other and creating really uh, outstanding things. Thank you very much for your attention.